Okay, I'm gonna start by putting some things in the chat box and these are links because I don't wanna share the screen um, because that's gonna take too much time. So what I'm gonna do is, if there's anybody that doesn't see these links, please let me know so I can try and make sure you get them in an email, but these are gonna be important. Here are three of them. Is there anyone that doesn't see them? There should be four links there. Okay. And I'm gonna start with the very first one. If you can uh, open up that link and everybody can open up that link, I'll describe why I put that link in there. And we're gonna start with that is the topic of the meeting. Okay. And if everybody can kind of give me, for the ones who have video, a thumbs up that they can actually see it. If there's anybody who, who can't get that link, please let me know. Okay, so what this meeting is today is to try and get very tight for a meeting that we're having Thursday, December 2nd at 8 a.m. Pacific with the Department of Defense, the Pentagon. The diversity and outreach team is providing us with an opportunity to meet some of their vendors who are in the business of outreach to K through 12, historically black colleges, Native American serving institutions and Hispanic, Hispanic serving institutions on doing outreach about diversity and inclusion, which includes some of the content that we own the rights to and manage. And most of all of this is going to be synthesized in a title of ethnic studies, which I'm calling history versus Hollywood. And this first link connects to what my initiative is with the Department of Defense. In prior meetings with them, they've asked for a couple of things they need help with. And these are vendor opportunities for us, for Dakar and all of our partners. They're looking for content or stories that they can drive through their outreach to these K through 12 classrooms and historically Native American and Hispanic serving institutions. And this is part of what they do calendar year round. So Native American History Month, Hispanic History Month, Black History Month, Pacific Islander, Women's History Month, they're always doing a program. And prior to COVID, they were doing these events on campuses. And they had a recruiting component where they would have a career fair. And some of the opportunities were to drive people to opportunities to look at careers in the non-combat military, which is working for the Department of Defense's satellite units, which include NSA, CIA, FBI, and other national security related entities were looking for people of color to serve in them. And traditionally what they do is something called Pentagon to the people. So they're not doing that anymore. So now they're needing for Black History Month, they need programming. And I, I want to provide them with a um, a short list of content related things that we can do that are Black History Month programs that I've done in the past. But this very first link connects to what we're trying to do is, is, is acquire the rights to take film projects either that are being greenlit or already in the can that we can actually format as potential ethnic studies and curriculum and lesson plans that we can then offer them as an opportunity to help uh, drive to their classroom. And what I'd like to have is an opportunity for everybody to chime in on what you think is the best way to bring these opportunities for curriculum and lesson plans into the classroom. Unfortunately, most of these will be virtual, will be either webinars, town halls, or some type of virtual film screening with a Q&A behind it. 
Um, this first film project that we have on the uh, screen here in the chat box is a good friend of mine who is a consulting producer on a project that's not military related, but it's black history. And it's something that's period piece related. It's called Black Cyclone. And this film project is one that I want to be able to have as a role model for what it is we're gonna be able to do to use influential marketing promotional material that can provide more interest, not just to the Pentagon and the schoolhouses, but mostly to the students. So I've got one student on the call right now, and I think for them, they need um, more stimuli than textbooks and lesson plans in order for them to be engaged. So I'm gonna stop right there. Does anybody have any questions, suggestions, or comments about what I've just said in terms of history versus Hollywood? Kevin, I have a question. So is the idea that, uh, this is Veretta, uh, is, the, is it the idea that the curriculum would be sent to the schools and the teachers that are already in place would be teaching or is it that you would have consultants or independent contractors that are um, deployed to be able to do the, the teaching? Right, so the alignment of what I think we have to offer at this point as a pilot will go to the existing departments of those universities, high schools who teach for its more specifically for uh, Black History Month, who offer some Black History Month programming to their classrooms. That's an easy way. That's an that's an easy get. But to um, to get the short to long term goal is ethnic studies will be uh, articulated by each campus, each uh, K through five, six through twelve, and college as something that they will have to be mandated to provide to their students. And that's what I've been talking to Julianne about, is how to make sure that we're um, in format and we're available for us to be able to make sure this content is available for each one of those uh, class, those uh, school grades, so that it be, can be made available for them as a pilot, so that they can actually right. start to look at the um, syllabus and all the other components as something right. that they could actually then start to look at as part of the mandate for them to cherry pick from because they'll have a, uh, a catalog of ethnic studies to choose from. And we want to make sure that whatever we can get in the format can be something that you know, would be compelling for them to choose from. And right. What I'm um, you know, at, at the so state of Illinois, it, um, as you know, I came from um, the Chicago area and the state of Illinois does have a mandate in place that is required that African American studies are um, taught in the schools. But there's definitely some risks around that. Um, what I can do, though, is find out they use um, they have the way that they're set up is they have a district, um, a school district within the state. And then that's how, you know, the things are trickled down to the other uh, districts. Um, and that's how they were able to roll that out. But I can do some more research and, and figure out because um, if they have a plan that works, then perhaps we can um, look at that. So this is for I'm done speaking. Okay, well, great. Yeah, and, and obviously, you know, each state, uh, each county has probably some um, things that they want to do differently as this thing becomes mandated. But as we get ahead of 2002 uh, in planning, I want to be able to make sure that we have a central place like the Department of Defense that can actually offer it to the people that they're networked with. Um, we're networked with community colleges, California State Universities, and to some degree, um, you know, we have pockets of people at USC and UCLA um, that may think of this as something from a programming standpoint, whether it be again, a webinar, a one-off that they would like to uh, make available to their students. And it does look like at this point for the uh, community colleges, they're still going to be doing uh, remote learning, unfortunately. So what I'm talking to the community colleges about is trying to make this something available that could be um, not only a pilot and something um, voluntary, but something that could map to some of the courseware where students can not only get a credit, um, but could be interested in being part of the development and the actual planning and execution of it. 
So uh, that's the very first um, thing I wanted to make sure is that this is a film project that I think I want to put into the catalog of stories that will help us, you know, again, bring uh, some idea that we have some compelling, you know, content. Got a person on the phone. Uh, Terrence, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, so uh, I don't have Terrence um, in the chat box, but I want Terrence to describe um, the film project that he did, he executed uh, for Veterans Day and how we plan on taking that uh, content and making sure that it becomes available for not just uh, the schoolhouses, but anybody and everybody that wants to learn um, how he plans on rolling out uh, episodically programming that could become part of what the DOD could li listen to as ways for them to engage it um, for ethnic studies in the future. So Terrence, can you describe your model sure. for how you take the, um, the um, homage to um, Black Patriots Project as, as well as other content that's related and, and describe what it is that you, you see as a way for that to become formatted for uh, an audience that could be ethnic studies? Sure. Uh, to read me up, really, um, so from what we did on Veterans Day was uh, speaking with General Bray uh, and also with historian Anthony Powell, we were able to bring a story of, we had 101-year-old Tuskegee Airman, as well as uh, stories that uh, Mr. Powell has pulled together. I think he's got 10 books worth of stories and artifacts. And the goal would be to look at those artifacts, and each artifact is really a story of a person. Uh, and so we have a pretty rich tapestry to pull from, I believe, in terms of stories that, that also can put a period into perspective. So this goes from, you know, Christmas addicts in the American Revolution to current people uh, that are veterans uh, that are serving today. And I think there's a through line, uh, certainly historically, and the ability to pick stories of individuals across that, that through line, I think gives us um, a big opportunity. And the goal would be these are probably vignettes, um, more in the, I don't know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes max uh, of each of these stories. Um, and we can reuse some of the content historically, right? So if you typically go to the Tuskegee Airmen, you can put World War II and their contribution, you know, in the context using something like Red Tails, right? And then as you put that in context, you have all the stories. I mean, Red Tails was one piece, and it's also not necessarily uh, as historical. But you could put historical stories in context from the stories like the Fall of 66, that Kevin and I worked on, which was, you know, MIA soldiers from the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, those kind of stories all the way through Chappie James, Moton Field, Tuskegee University. Um, and that's just one example I think that we're close to. There are the Buffalo Soldiers and other opportunities. So, you know, I see that as a, opportunity. you know, we have a template now that we can pull together. There's a gentleman, Chauncey Spencer. Um, he was, at least historically speaking, very instrumental in the formation of Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, and this is Tony Spencer Sr. His son is traveling around the country with a mobile exhibit uh, using his story as a way to teach about Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, but he's one story, and I feel like we can uh, mirror that across multiple stories, and, and that would be the goal of the project. Um, we have access to the talent. We have access probably to legal resources, all the creative parts of that. So I think from a production standpoint, I think we have a pretty good model. Um, it's just a matter of taking the intellectual property of the various stories, putting them in historical context. And, and for me, to this group, how do we make sure that that makes it into the educational realm, right? How do you take a movie like Glory and put the Civil War in context, and then we can tell the stories of real people? Um, but that, that being taught is probably the missing link, at least for me anyway, uh, as, a, as a creative and producer of that type. You know, we can tell those stories, the context um, to how we get that in the curriculum uh, would be the collaboration that I'd love to form with this group. Right. And intellectual property, of course, Kevin, General Bray, uh, Mr. Powell. Right. And does anybody have any questions, uh, comments to what Terrence said? Because I want to, uh, to his point, I want to make a, uh, a pivot. Anybody have anything to say about what Terrence just mentioned before I remark? Okay, great. Um, my um, first thought about history versus Hollywood came from the movie Glory. I interviewed the writer, director, and producer of the movie Glory, Ed, Ed Zwick, uh, when I was a journalist at the um, was a freelance journalist. And I interviewed him at the American Film Institute uh, screening series. 
and he was screening another movie, but I asked him about the movie Glory, and he said that he got more requests for the film's transcripts, the actual script from the movie to um, really to Terrence's point, the film provided a tremendous amount of lesson plans for teachers K through 12 to teach students about the Civil War. And those teachers requested the transcripts or the scripts from the movie and it became uh, almost default for these teachers to um, again, provide more context and more compelling information uh, to the students because they did film screenings with the movie Glory and the scripts. Um, and that gave me the idea that, again, all of these movies that have been period piece about the uh, timeline that I believe is something that we're focused on uh, with the African-American military timeline is something that we can um, take that idea and make it available as ethnic studies so that teachers can, in addition to looking at the, the transcripts and the text script, they can add on excerpts from the films, backstories and other documentaries to teach and provide lesson plans for the content known as ethnic studies. Um, so that's kind of my thought process and some of the things that um, we own the rights to is a film project called For Love of Liberty. It's the last link in the first uh, box. If you click on to that, um, no, actually it's the third, third to the last. If you click on to that link, that is part of the lesson plan that was um, available for uh, different classes. They had guys, facilitator guys for K through 12 and then one for the colleges. And that became a very popular um, tool for the documentary as a companion to make sure that it was um, something that was a leave behind for the educators to provide some Black History Month programming. But again, those teachers could use this content in various ways throughout the year. And so um, if you guys look at that uh, and just click on it, the For Love of Liberty lesson plan and facilitator guide was something that never really got exploited as much because the distribution of it um, was lacking. Uh, so my plan is that um, we repurpose this content that I now have the permission from the writer, director, producer, Frank Martin to take this back out and do experiential events like what Terrence did, but to be able to make sure that, it, again, it is formatted for K through 12, whether it be K through five, six through 12 in colleges, so that, again, it could be part of the ethnic studies plan. So that is what um, my goal is, is to take For Love of Liberty as one of the projects we have the rights to, to make that available as a pilot project that the Department of Events, I think, would be very interested in. Um, so here's General Bray. Thank you, General Bray, for joining us. Um, and you know, for uh, General Bray, this is uh, for you only. What we've been talking about is using the content that we have either permission or rights to try and convert it to curriculum, lesson plan, and eventually ethnic studies that can be mandated for, um, for each grade school, K through five, six through 12, and colleges to be able to study and be tested on this ethnic studies. So that is what we're going to be, again, uh, approaching the Department of Defense and all of the things that they have been interested in is how do we put this into format for educational purposes. And so um, General Bray has helped me put together for the Department of Defense something that um, has become my, my Venn diagram for how education, history, sense of purpose, belonging can add to the mix of things that a lot of the educators may not have thought of when they think about ethnic studies. Uh, so General Bray, um, I, I don't wanna put you on the spot. If you can, can you talk about your uh, original reason for how the Venn diagram would provide a um, kind of a, a roadmap for how anybody would understand how Dakar could uh, make sure this is you know, this is the essence of why uh, we're doing what we're doing, and if if you don't if you don't mind, I, I'd like to have your uh, description of it. I, I, I'm going to make sure that everybody has a look at the Venn diagram, 
and the application of it, but I didn't want to use that for this meeting. I'll, I will do that for Thursday's meeting. Yeah, the uh, the, the diagram is, is really a series of five activities that the car had been operating in with the intent of providing opportunities for what I've since rede redefined as U3D or underserved, underrepresented, undervalued and disenfranchised communities. Specifically, uh, those communities that we would formerly have thought of as black and brown, but without going into that in any great detail, it was a recognition that the world is changing, but the communities and the people of those communities have not and they're still missing the gap. A lot of them don't understand who they are. So at the very top of the issues was an understanding of a sense of purpose and belonging. And that's where character and leader development resides. It was letting people understand that they have a history because most kids from these communities think that every time they do something that is wild and wonderful, there's a belief that they're the first ones. They just, they're the first ones that did it, but of, of their ilk. But this is where ethnic studies comes in. It basically gives you a chance to look at the history, to look at the history of who you are and realize that you are in fact you are in fact blessed, you are in fact capable, you are in fact uh, a product of, uh, uh, of, of the history that has made this nation, this world, uh, what it is. And so you, you give them multiple examples uh, of, of that as part of their history. In other words, it's not about trying to give them history for history's sake, because it, every time you do history, it should be so what? It should be, it should answer a so what? It is not because you want to make historians out of them. You want to make them rooted in the capability to do more. You want to, you want to make sure that people see General Bray, I think we lost you. Can anyone else not hear General Bray? Hello? Oh, okay, I think you got me. Can you can't hear me? Yes, we got you, sir. Kevin, you can't hear me? Yeah, we hear you, we hear you now. We lost you for about 30 seconds. Oh. Okay, it, it is, the purpose of history is to provide a platform for the future. And so the, 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 the top of the platform is character leader development, a sense of rootedness, to let them know that one, they're not jumping off, they're not going blind. Every time they do something, they're not just the first ones walking through the door, but indeed they are they are capable of going to something else. And so that's what the history is about. That's, and, and then more importantly, this is a nation that is defined by those who've invested blood and treasure. People always want to go back and show that my daddy, my granddaddy, my great granddaddy, well, this shows them that your cousin, your great granddaddy in many cases, his history was not, or her history was not necessarily captured. So therefore your history is not captured. And so you give them the so what to it. There was a gentleman named Dr. Carl Mack from the National Society of Black Engineers. He was the, he was a, uh, he's, he is in fact an engineer, but when he was going through uh, Mississippi State to be an engineer, he believed that one, he was like, breaking brand new ground. It was not until his later years in life that he found out that there were all these wonderful people that, you know, like we've shown from hidden figures that people were saying, wait a minute. You, it, so I wasn't the first one. So, it, and for him, it would have made what he called quantum mechanics a lot easier because he thought he was breaking new ground. He didn't realize there was even a network out there that could help him understand and go forward. I'm an alpha man. Okay, that's my fraternity. 
my fraternity is based upon the fact that one, we we had people searching and doing a literature search that before we became a fraternity, we weren't trying to be the first black frat. We were trying to be a fraternity of inclusion. And two members who had formerly been from HBCUs went to Cornell because Ezra Cornell's philosophy simply said, if you can, if you can pass our test, you have full access and rights. And so that piece of history becomes institutionalized in my memory. And so therefore I'm obligated to try to share with people a platform to go forward. That's what the Dakar diagram was designed to do. It was designed to, to lead them toward opportunities both from within, so there's a confidence piece that goes with it, and then expose them to those things that are that are associated with National Society of Black Engineers, with uh, with mathematics, with environmental sciences, and 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 oh by the way, be able to tell your story, to tell the story, this time from the from the perspective of others, in front of, behind. And within the camera, so that one, most of us know this, but and I'll and I'll say this: history written is usually pretty good. History captured in the visual is often misleading and leads to a perspective that is absolutely sometimes incorrect. And the car gives a chance to change all those things. Okay, I, I, I've, I've preached too much and too long, and I apologize for that. No, General Bray, no, you set it up perfectly because this meeting today is really preparing us for our third conversation with the Department of Defense and Victoria Bowens. And um, you are the soul of the brand that we're using to synthesize all the things that we can offer up the Department of Defense because they, they truly do have a need. They've asked for someone as a consultant or as a group to help us make sure that we're um, not all over the place and offering them up solutions to their problems. And it starts literally with a narrative, not just content or stories and tools. And you know, again, um, the tools that they, they talk about are how to get better at social media, um, you know, how to get better at you know, reaching these students when and where they are, but we can't use the students to determine what they need because we absolutely have to be leaders and ensure that they don't understand what their needs are sometimes in terms of what it is that is missing in their day to day. So um, I, I truly believe that you set the narrative for what I think everybody should, should hear in terms of how we started and how we can still deliver um, the things that um, will, will become our I apologize. Black, black black so, um, so right now, I, I, um, Lemur just dropped off, but I was going to have him talk about um, how we try and use the tools. That was the, uh, the last part of the conversation is tools. And some of the things that uh, we want to embed in top in, on, on the uh, top of the uh, list of things that I believe are tools beyond social media are ways to engage students in things that they need, like exposure to financial wealth um, and not just financial wealth, but some of the barriers to wealth and some of the issues they may have and not understanding what they can do to get beyond survival. So those are the things that we definitely want to make sure that we're not just pushing um, content and tools as a consultant, but we're also helping to provide a narrative where students, you know, not only get um, the things in the Venn diagram from a sense of history, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, but also a sense of how they can be able to lead themselves, especially economically, socially, and socially um, be responsible to one another. Um, we just had a, a new friend join the call. Um, Terrence Mayfield, Terrence, are you there? Terrence, if you can unmute. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Yes, Terrence. Okay, so General Bray just finished talking about 
Um, I believe the narrative, you understand the Venn diagram. Um, and this is, uh, again, a meeting preparing us for the Department of Defense on Thursday morning at eight o'clock. Um, and I, I'd like if you can to share with the, the team that we have assembled here about your narrative and your vision for how all the kind of content that you've heard, you know, from Mr. Powell, from myself, can be drilled down into educational uh, products, tools, to especially the HBCUs, and your vision for how we can create a pilot project for something that the Department of Defense can be a, um, a, a an important agent in helping us get it to all the HBCUs and all the schoolhouses that we have influence on. So if you, if you can, that's a lot to say, but you know, if you can just give us some understanding of where you sit and how to um, get information out to the HBCUs at, at the very least. Where my um, expertise in this space is, we know that technology is the driver. And as we start to deal with the cultural dynamics of how the world is moving, we know that access to capital and tying education that is applicable today, meaning putting men and women that are in distressed environments, men and women that are in HBCUs to be able to participate in the tech revolution. We know that over a million jobs based on the data that's out will be available in the next 10 years as a shortage of talent into the tech space. We know that that's the game change that we're moving into the new dimensions of everything happens in this virtual world. So what I look at in terms of the department, any department is how are you using immersive technology as a driver for education, for closing the wealth gap, for disseminating information, which means that we have to have proper infrastructure in the communities that normally are left behind and what better place to do that than to check that mindset in the HBCUs as well as distressed cities that will benefit from becoming a technology quarter, specifically serving underserved, underbanked, undereducated, disenfranchised, and politically ignored communities, now, unless there's an election, of course. Uh, that becomes the, the tool with which we discover or introduce what they think is untapped um, talent and resources. The sad thing about all of this is that they don't realize that in our communities that that brain power that they're looking for already exists and they hadn't even thought to look in our communities in that particular way. So my job is to bring resources to the table with some funding sources that I have to acquire assets to stabilize the redevelopment of communities uh, because we know uh, on top of being able to have jobs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we have to have access to capital that allows us to get, provide real ownership opportunities. So that's what I'm doing in a nutshell. Great. And um, before I stop uh, talking, I, I definitely want anybody to chime in. Does anybody um, have anything to add? Because we're rushing up against 845. Um, because I want to give you guys the one model of what the Department of Defense has funded and supported so that uh, we don't have to start at the beginning. So before I go to that one, is there anybody that uh, is needing to chime in? Okay. Only thing I'll say, Kevin, is uh, I'll send around the link after this. If you give it to what, the completed piece from homage and you'll, you'll hear General Bray, you'll see Anthony Powell, you'll see some of the, the things that may bring this to light, at least in terms of, of the kind of content we can bring to the table. So uh, I will follow up with this team uh, with that information. Uh, and Terrence, uh, as the other Terrence, I'd be very interested in all the technology. I'm, I'm very versed in everything from AI to the metaverse, you name it, technology-wise, I'm probably in it. and happy to work with you on providing that to our kids. Oh, wow, fantastic. Yeah, you guys fantastic. haven't met each other, but you soon will. Um, there's, there's definitely a tremendous amount of synergy between you two guys. So um, the one model that the Department of Defense touts um, and has um, funded for something that I want to, um, let's say, um, not only model around and work around, 
but I think that we can um, add some components to it that uh, they didn't have, which was a um, five-year engagement with a uh, area called Boyle Heights. Um, and Boyle Heights is a area of South LA that um, is almost 100% Hispanic um, and Latin American. And um, the Department of Defense with the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, for five years, they did a program called STEM Up that uh, worked K through five, six through 12. I don't believe they went to the colleges, but they spent a tremendous amount of time in introducing students to STEM related curriculum, um, as well as the types of um, things that would provide an archetype for students to learn how to be more engaged in serving, serving their communities. And in working with the Army Corps and engineers, they learned about uh, the natural resources, the waterways, um, and all the things that you know, provided them with more awareness of their surroundings. And some of them had never been outside of the city of LA, uh, had you know, just never been exposed to things and just didn't know what they didn't know. Um, and this was a five-year program. I got involved with it at the tail end uh, of it, but it, again, it just served um, the area called Boyle Heights. And it was a very, very highly supported, nationally recognized program that just served um, about 120 students. Um, and before I, I move on, General Brady, do you want to say anything about STEM Up? Because I'm going to uh, make sure that everybody has a, um, uh, the deck and all the information I received um, from STEM Up to try to help them at that time, which was in 2012, to help them get better with social media and in technological tools. But the, um, the, the thing that I want to do is to try and, and, and again, take that model and make sure the DOD knows that we can do some things in 2022, almost 10 years later, that would make sure that this serves more than 120 students. General Bray, is there anything you want to say about it? Stem up. Okay, so I will um, make sure that again, in preparation for the meeting on Thursday at 8 a.m., we have um, the model, we have an agenda that will um, allow the, the model for which I believe our uh, collective efforts can um, put together a pilot project for Black History Month. And it's just ironic that you know February is our opportunity to showcase some of the content that we can manage. And um, you know, again, um, have the permission and rights to uh, promote to the DOD for them to not just um, you know, engage it, but to license it as a pilot. And the idea really is to make sure that the, uh, the agenda is something that you guys can see before Thursday. And I'll allow anybody to help edit it uh, to make sure that there's no typos, there's nothing that doesn't uh, seem out of place and something that flows because we have 45 minutes with them. That's the reason I wanted to make sure that this meeting is 45 minutes because they will cut us off at 46 minutes. Um, and we'll have to have time to present what we're presenting, but leave time for them to do Q&A so that um, we'll have an opportunity to use that meeting to do an after action review for them. So uh, is there anybody that has any questions, suggestions, comments before we break con contact? Okay. All right. So Thursday, December 2nd, put that on your calendar. Zoom. Uh, we'll start this. They'll be on the call five minutes before eight o'clock. Uh, I'll be 11 o'clock uh, their time. And uh, so look at this agenda as a way for us to be crisp and uh, have you know ourselves in a position to present the things that they then can have questions and hopefully we'll have all the answers for them. All right, so thank everybody for joining the call. And uh, for Linda, I, I will reach back out to you regarding programming for the City Club. And uh, anybody else that needs to reach me, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. So thanks again for everybody for joining the call. Bye. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs>